we were doing a patrol um, in Gandhar province and we were walking down a, a wadi, a dried out riverbed. And we walked around the corner and it was almost like a cartoon moment. It's the first time we'd seen Taliban or enemy because you don't really know what to do when you see somebody with a gun. Um, so we all raised our guns and started firing at each other out of a panic and so did they and not, we stopped, all the clips ran out on both sides and we were looking at each other and it was actually one of those funny moments where people were checking their clothing and even they were too and then they just ran off. And we were all sitting there like checking our rounds, put new magazines in, fired at the ground, they worked. So if you actually do the math, that's 30 rounds, five people times two. So that's, it's impossible. Up until then, I was not really a Christian. I grew up in a Christian home, but when you're bombarded with John 3.16 in the church all the time, we actively went to the church. Parents did a really good job that way, but I rebelled during my teen years, got into drugs, uh, a lot of other things, and then I joined the army kind of on a bet and also to kind of shock myself into something new, something hard, and get away from drugs and everything else I was doing. But once I got in the army, it's, I hate to say it, but it's an, anti-God kind of establishment. And if you'd say Jesus, people laugh at you, you hear every joke under the sun. So I just kind of went with the flow. And I didn't really enjoy that. It didn't really feel good for many years. I mean, I have a lot of good years in the career and a lot of fun stories, but it's something was missing. PTSD, I was diagnosed just at the end of my career when it was already too late. Now after Afghanistan, when I came home, it was uh, just hard to deal with stuff. Getting anxious for the first time. I didn't even know what anxiety was until I got home. and. Crowds would pop up and I'd start sweating. I couldn't walk. I felt like I was drunk walking, even though you were sober, it was awful. And at the end, I lost my child, my spouse, my career. Uh, basically, I got home, lost my car, had to claim bankruptcy. I lost everything, absolutely everything. Had to move back in with my parents, which is the worst experience of my entire life. And that's when, because of such a Christian loving home, my mom just started reiterating what she used to say that used to annoy me and I actually started reading the Bible, started talking to God and then he audibly started talking in my head to me and it blew me out of the water. And I, I changed certain habits on, in myself but I didn't change, I think God changed my heart because there's certain things that I would do or say that I was aware that they were wrong but then all of a sudden some days I just wouldn't say them, I wouldn't even think about them anymore so that's something supernatural changing you inside. And that, I don't know, is the best thing in the world, I think. It was very odd, he said to me audibly in my head one day, to not drink, not go to bars, not try to seek for affection in another woman. You just take a break, he said, two years, and I will find somebody for you. And I thought that was so specific and weird. So I, I did that. I, I met Michaela, my wife, three years now, and still no car, but I have, uh, free education from Veterans Affairs, and uh, it's pretty unreal. It changes it around now. I've already graduated a program. I'm on my last year of biotechnology, and I'm happily married with a, a lovely apartment. Kicking, moving a lot. He's a fighter. She's very wise and steadfast. She doesn't move. I'm so proud of you. And very gently, keep on reiterating a point to correct you. And I love the fact that she always listens to everything. I pray to the Lord I'd say a couple months ago, just to ask, what do, what do I do daily? What's my mission daily? Just from me to you, and I know it's specific for every individual when it comes to the Lord, but he said, Peg, you flap around like a, a tent all the time with your mouth sometimes and the, your actions, and you do some good things for me, and then you'll flap around and go off that in that direction. And he said, uh, Philippians, Ephesians, and Galatians, think of it as peg. So a tent peg that pegs you down, and I'm your holy tent. So I thought about it and I've been staying in those three books and just living them out every day and it's worked, worked wonders. Uh, I've had about eight friends, close friends, that have died from suicide. And even to me, they they were happy-go-lucky people. There's no rhyme or reason why they should have done that except hope. That's what I, I nailed it down to, the lack of hope. They get home, they have the same issues that I have, the post-traumatic stress, anxiety, but they're still serving in the military which I think makes it 10 times worse because you can't get away from that atmosphere. Eventually you hit a wall and you won't be able to, you, you have to deal with yourself. So when you can't deal with yourself, I wish these guys would know, you talk to God and he'll deal with you. For anybody who has anxiety or post-traumatic stress or especially struggling veterans, it, it sounds harsh, but pick up the word and start praying. And if you don't know what to say, just pray to the Lord, ask him. Like, just, like he's your friend, ask him what, how to change how to fix this, what to do, he'll answer you. 
It's, it's so important and it's right there and everybody scoffs at it, but look what happens in the opposite. People kill themselves because they have no hope. So pick hope.